Thank you, Brother Mark, for filling in as I was a long ways away. If you have your Bibles, please turn it into the book of Acts, chapter 17. Acts 17 is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible because we get to see Paul's approach on how he talks to people. It's called apologetics, to give a defense or to give a reason why you believe what you believe. But more so in Acts 17, we get to see that he talks to three different people groups on four different occasions, and they all are uniquely different. We have Jews that he's going to talk to with some of uh, the next time we're going to see some devout Jews that go directly to the scriptures. We're going to see uh, pagans, people that don't believe in God. They believe in everything else other than actually uh, the Lord himself and possibly philosophers in the Areopagus. We get to see Paul share the message of Christ with multitudes of people because he wants to know what they believe. Now, the title of the sermon is, What Do You Believe? Jesus Wants to Know. That's not to say that Jesus is ignorant. That's not to say he's not omniscient, that he does not know everything. Jesus knows everything. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, according to John chapter 1, verse 1. That's Jesus is the embodiment of God himself. He knows everything. We don't. And God uses who to carry the message of the gospel? He uses us. Frail, fickle, sometimes just broken, shattered vessels. And we don't know everything. So actually, what, you, what do you believe is for our benefit because we want to know what people believe because Jesus wants to know through us to reach people. So that's what this lesson is about uh, today. So if you find your way to Acts 17, you can read overhead or you can read in your Bibles. He says, now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, enjoying Paul and Silas, along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have upset the world, have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released him. So a little bit of dynamics going on here in the Greco-Roman world, which we'll get to. But when we talk about what do you believe, We have to take some steps in order to get to know people. And we're going to see this lesson here from Paul. Number one, do you believe in the Bible or the traditions of men? Do you believe in the Bible or the traditions of men? Notice Paul's segue here. Who is he talking to and where is he at? He's in the synagogue full of Jews who understand the Torah, that's the law of God. They are devout to the old covenant as we take a look at it in our Bibles. But there's God-fearing Greeks. Those are non-Jews who come to believe in Yahweh himself, but they're not converted to Judaism. They're non-Jews that have not been converted, and then there's leading women, which we'll be talking about. So what does Paul appeal to when he goes directly into the synagogue? Scripture. Why scripture? Because in the synagogue, that's what they claim to believe. We're going to see later on in Acts 17 when Paul talks at the Areopagus on Mars Hill, Paul doesn't quote scripture. Why? Because they don't care. They don't care about scripture. He uses another bridge. But when he goes into the synagogue, he's surrounded by religious people. Judaism is awaiting for the Messiah to come still to this day. Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism, saying Messiah has come. We're waiting for his return because Jesus had to take the penalty of sin upon himself to remove it as far as the east is from the west so that when the Messiah returns, we will be ready. In Judaism, there's recorded, there's two different views upon the Messiah. 
Messiah, son of David, King David, coming from the reigning lineage of King David, uh, that Messiah, that king, that anointed one is going to restore Israel. It's going to kick out the Gentiles, Roman oppression and rulers. It's going to be the messianic reign on earth. Messiah ben David, ben being son of, son of, son of David. There was a small sect in Judaism that believed in Messiah ben Joseph. Uh, not Joseph and Mary, but Messiah, son of Joseph. If you read the book of Genesis and you read from the 12 kids, you get Joseph, who is loved by his father, set apart amongst all of them, betrayed by his brothers, put in a cistern in the ground for several days as if dead, sold into the hands of Gentiles, betrayed, and rises up to second in charge just below Pharaoh. And when his brothers who are Jews come to him, they don't recognize him because he looks like a Gentile. Until Joseph reveals himself, and he says, Ani Yosef, I am Joseph. I'm the one that you betrayed, but do not worry what you meant for evil, God meant for good. So if you read the story of Joseph, which takes up quite a bit of the Genesis account, you begin to see parallels with Joseph and what happened to Jesus. But Judaism was waiting for the reigning king of David, the reigning king. We got to get this Gentile oppression off of us because we're Jews and we're guaranteed a place in the world to come. We don't need our, son, our, 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 our sins atoned for. So Paul is in the synagogue reasoning with them who is the Messiah, which in Greek we translate that as Christ, anointed one. He reasons with them. Look at if you and I are going to be effective people that shine the love of Jesus with people, we got to know our audience. If I'm going to talk with religious people that say, well, I'm a Christian too, we're kind of like the same thing. Well, reason with me from the scripture because when I read the scripture, Jesus is not the brother of Lucifer. Jesus is not the brother of Satan. Jesus is not created. He's the uncreated one. He's God manifest in the flesh. And I can give you multiple references aside from John 1 uh, verse 1. Talk to me. If you claim to be a Christian, reason with me from the scriptures. You're religious, I'm religious. As a matter of fact, when I read the scriptures, Jesus is not the archangel Michael. So Jehovah's Witness were not the same. LDS Mormons were not the same. Because we, you got to convince me with this, convince me with scripture and reason. Paul is going to scripture. He says, look, if you believe in the Messiah, if you believe that this Messiah is coming, let's search from Genesis to Malachi. Because remember, there is no New Testament at this point. He goes directly to the Old Testament and he uses the scriptures to make his argument because he's surrounded by religious people. He dialogues with them. This word reason, in your translations, it might say argue. Uh, it's not like American arguing or Western arguing. You start talking and I start talking over you because I just love to hear myself talk. And we just start going back and forth, right? You ever been in a family like that? You got one particular person that's the alpha male or the alpha female? And they ask you a question, and as you start answering, they answer the question for you because they don't really want your answer anyways. And when you're explaining something, they just talk over you. And it's just like our voices get louder and louder and louder and louder, and all of a sudden you're arguing. That's not what this word carries here. This word carries conversation, questions and answers, dialogue. Hey, so what do you believe? This is what I believe. In our homeless ministry and in food bank or when, we're at, uh, when I talk with college students, young adults, whatever, whatever it may be, you ask them questions. They ask them questions. Hey, so what do you believe? Do you have a spiritual background? No, I don't. Well, if you don't, do you believe in God? No, I don't. Well, I, well I'm not going to quote you this. Why? Because you don't care. Do you believe that people are broken and suffering in the world? Yeah, I do. Hey, let's talk about that. You find your bridge, but you have to ask questions. Study the life of Jesus. Look at in the Gospels when he encounters people. He asks more questions than he does the talking. So who are you living with? And then he, whoop. Well, you know, living with my husband. Actually, it's not your husband. You're actually not even married to him. As a matter of fact, he had eight husbands. He asks the question, builds the bridge. She starts opening up the woman at the well. Jesus starts with grace, and then he brings her the truth. We need to learn to ask more questions. God gave us two ears and one mouth. I think the numbers outweigh the fact that we need to be good, active listeners, 
and not always talking. Here's the other thing too. If you're going to ask a question, be an active listener. An active listener is engaged in the moment, mentally, emotionally, physically. I'm asking a question because I want to hear what's on your heart. If you're Buddhist, if you're Hindu, if you're Muslim, if you're atheist, it doesn't matter what it is. I want to know. I'm not trying to prepare an answer. Hey, so what do you believe? Oh, so what am I going to say? I'm waiting for them to say something because, and then you start, you don't even listen to what's going on. If they're going to be vulnerable and answer you, be genuine enough to be actively listening. I don't believe in God. I was raised in the church. I abandoned the church because I see suffering and evil. I see whatever it may be. Wow. So that's what's really on your heart. You see people that are broke. You actively listen and then you engage with them. Talk with them. That's what this word carries. It's a dialogue. It's a questions and answers. But look at He explains. He gives evidence. This idea of explaining is you take something complex and you make it simple. Make it simple. We have a lot of, so there's a lot of people that don't read this because they don't even know where to start. But I started in John. You said the book of John. Where's, where's, where's John at? What page number is that? Because I don't even know where it's at. So you take something complex and you make it simple. Paul is taking something complex. He's proving that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, because with that acknowledgement comes the message of the gospel. So I want to take you through the gospel because uh, I'll use one particular method called the three circles. God has a design for you and me. He created in the garden. There it is, Genesis. We were, we were made perfect. He had a design. He had a purpose for us. But you know what you and I did? We chose to turn our backs on God. We chose to exercise freedom. And we said, thank you, Lord, but I got it from here. I'm going to do things my way. I think you're holding out on something on me because I think I'm going to just do it my way. So we sin. That's sin. Sin is rebellion against God. And when we sin, we stepped into brokenness. And brokenness leads to more brokenness. And when we make broken decisions from brokenness, we just compound the brokenness. We search for our solution in relationships and drugs and alcohol and all the things and sex and all the stuff that we can get. But it only leads to more brokenness. But you know what brokenness does provide? It provides a reality check that you need an answer. You need a solution. God saw us in our brokenness, and he didn't leave us there. John 3, 16, for God to love the world, that he sent Jesus. Sent his one and only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus came to live the life that you can't live, to pay the sin debt that you can never pay back, and to be the ransom and the sacrifice for us so that we can be restored to God. That's good news. Other religions, man, your karma better be super good because you got good karma and you got bad karma. You better outweigh one or the other. Well, how do I know if I do? You don't. When you die, I think maybe you're going to get converted to like a dog. Well, I don't know. You might move up the food chain or you're going to move down the food chain. But here's the reality. You truly don't know how good your karma is because if you did something really, really, really bad, how many good karma steps do you got to do? If I help somebody financially, is that like five? Or do I need 20? You don't know. If you're a Muslim and you are worshiping Allah, and Allah, according to the Quran, he could change his mind at any moment. He's capricious. He'll change his mind. So you're doing hospitality. You're doing all the works. You go on the pilgrimage. You're coming back. You are trying to get... At any moment, Allah can change his mind and send you to hell because he can, because that's just how he is. They recognize that. Muslims recognize that. But the gospel says Jesus doesn't change. The gospel says he's the one that paid the penalty, and he extends that as a free gift of salvation. Here's the good news. Here's the bad news. You're broken in your sin. Here's the good news. The penalty has been paid for you, and it's a free gift. Not built on your karma. And Jesus isn't going to change his mind because Scripture cannot be broken. It's written. And then that causes you and I to choose to repent and believe. I hear it. Man, that's awesome. Yeah, I want that. I want that. Repent, turning 180 degrees from your broken life, and you turn to Jesus. That's what it is. It's a step in faith. You believe in your mind. You believe in your heart. You believe, and it impacts your decisions from here on out. And when you and I choose to believe in Jesus as the way, the solution, the way, the truth, and the life, 
God restores our design. You and I recover and pursue our purpose again. Every single one of you here in person, online, doesn't matter. Every person that's outside these buildings, everybody who's created in the image of God, and that's all humanity, has a God-given purpose. But if you don't know Jesus, you're trying to find that purpose in all the brokenness around you. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to, in, you're going to in turn break people because by nature, according to Jeremiah, our hearts are selfish, perverted, and wicked. We consume people. And then when, when we're done consuming people, we move to the next person. Or somebody consumes us. And when they're done using us and abusing us, does that sound familiar? Then they move on to somebody else. Brokenness. But you got to come to know who Jesus is. That's the life-changing that's taking the salvation story, breaking it down. You have a purpose. And if you don't know Jesus, you're, you're, you have a lot of energy. And you're directing it all in the wrong direction. How about let's get that focus on the right direction and for you to come to know who Jesus is. And the potential that you have is unheard of. If we would just choose to believe and repent, we'll recover because all of this is accomplished because of the cross. It has nothing to do with your karma. It has nothing to do with how good you perform. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with what Jesus did. That's good news. Bad news, we're broken. Good news is Jesus saves. But what would you choose to believe? You see, we can give all the evidence that we want. We can use different diagrams for spiritual laws, Romans Road, whatever it is. You can give all the evidence to people's objections, but remember this, evidence in and of itself is not the answer. It's not. Jesus is the answer. There's people that doubt the authority of Scripture. It has too many errors in it, and it's been written by men, and it's been translated multiple times. We don't even have the original copies of the New Testament. Well, we don't have the original scroll of Moses either. But we have the law of God. We have copies of copies of copies but yeah, all those are just, I mean, if you could just prove that it's reliable. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. I have more, but I don't, don't want to be that long-winded. How many of you have ever heard of Julius Caesar? Ete Brute, right? No, oh, sure. Julius Caesar, Gaelic Wars. He wrote the Gaelic Wars. He's the preeminent Roman person that <laughs> crossed the Rubicon. It's history. It's fact. Do you know when Julius Caesar wrote the Gaelic Wars? Around uh, 50 B.C. 50 B.C., before Christ. Do you know how many manuscripts are in existence of the Gaelic Wars that we have? Ten. Ten. Do you know the oldest manuscript that we have? It dates back to... 850 A.D. It's 900 years removed from when Julius Caesar actually wrote the Gaelic Wars. Almost a thousand years removed. And it's fact. Check your history books. Nobody questions it. Gaelic Wars written by Julius Caesar. Only ten copies. The oldest is a th uh, almost a thousand years removed. Factual. We don't question what the contents in there we don't question. Tacitus who wrote Roman, he was a Roman historian who wrote the Annals and Histories. He composed his work, he wrote it down originally around 110 to 115 AD. The oldest manuscripts to date that we have date to the 9th and 11th century AD. That's 800 and 1,000 years. Do you know how many manuscripts and fragments we have of the New Testament? Over 25,000. And the oldest one that we have dates roughly about 200 years from the time it was originally written. And everybody questions the New Testament. Why don't we question Gaelic Wars? There's only 10 of those in existence, and that's almost 1,000 years removed. Why don't we question the Roman historian Tacitus? That's factual and also in your history books. But we take those two things as fact, and we have over 25,000 manuscripts and you put them all together, there's a 99% accuracy within all of it. There's a few uh, lines that people do have questions about, but it pertains to nothing that's doctrinal within Christianity. And secular historians question that as if 
It had no evidence. If you compare the New Testament manuscripts with all ancient antiquity, we can't say all but the ones that I mentioned, it far outweighs the comparison and it pastors, uh, pastors, it passes above and beyond textual criticism and it still comes under attack, but nobody wants to question these documents over here. Now, do those facts, are those facts interesting? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Are those facts going to save you? Nope. Because facts and evidence doesn't save people. Jesus saves people. You and I can give all the evidence, and I have a lot more here, but evidence isn't going to save you. We need to remember that. Jesus sends us into the world to find a bridge, talk with people, find out what they believe, and share the message of Christ. Share the message of Christ. Man, we got to be able to talk. We got to be able to reason. We got to be able to explain. That means that there's no topics that are off limits. If you want to talk about drugs and alcohol and sex and pornography, let's go ahead and talk about it. You want to talk about gay, transgender, gender confusion, identity, homosexuality, same-sex attraction? Let's go ahead and talk about it. Because the church has been asleep far too long to be talking about this because it's taboo. It sounds awkward. Let's not talk about it. But if people are searching for the truth, I'm letting you know, if you're a believer in Christ, you have to talk about these topics. Because if you don't, TikTok will. And so will all the other social media platforms. But if they're searching for truth, you and I have to dialogue about things that make us uncomfortable or things that might trigger something from your past. Because who knows, did, can God allow that item that happened to you, can God use that to reach somebody else that has absolutely no hope at all? And I would say absolutely he can. But you gotta be willing you got to be willing to allow him to use that. we got to find a bridge. If you're religious, if you claim to be a Christian, then let's go to the Bible. Let's talk about scripture. Let's talk about textual criticism. Let's talk about all that fun stuff. If you're a Hindu or a Buddhist, well, you're not really going to recognize this. Hey, how do you deal with the problem of evil and suffering? Let's talk about that. If you're an atheist, hey, what's your answer to the problem of evil and suffering? And if the atheist is honest, they'll say, I don't have one. This world is as good as it gets. Well, let me share with you what I believe. There might be holes in my presentation, but let me talk to about the brokenness. Let me talk about God stepping down. Let me talk about the salvation. We can find a bridge, but you got to know your audience because either we're going to believe in this. If you're a Christian and you claim to believe in Jesus, follow him, love him, your life is dedicated to him, the Bible defines sexuality, not culture. The Bible defines uh, truth, not culture. Because if we start swaying to believe that culture defines everything, you don't truly believe Scripture. You don't. And so when we question ourselves, man, Holy Spirit, point us into the direction of Jesus. I don't have all the answers, but I want to be known that I'm defending the faith. Because it's not yours and my job to reinvent the gospel, to make it palatable for culture. It's our responsibility to carry the gospel to the next generation faithfully. That's what Christians are called to do. That's what the, these authors did. Church history. Find the bridge. What is common? What can you talk about? Secondly, do you believe the gospel is for all people? Or do you believe it's for a certain race? A certain ethnicity? Do you believe it's for a certain social class? You got to be rich. You got to be middle income. You can't be poor. Do you, so do you believe truly that the gospel is for all people? Because if you take a look at Acts 17, there's a lot of people in the synagogue. And they were Jews. They were non-Jews. And they were leading women. In Greco-Roman history, women could choose their religion as long as they didn't revolt against their husband's religion. So in Judaism, the biggest converts were actually women. Women from a Greco-Roman pagan household, they converted over to Judaism where they um, followed Judaism. And notice when Paul presents the gospel that Jesus is king and Jesus is the Christ, some of the Jews believe God-fearers are those that weren't circumcised. They did not convert to Judaism, but they believed in the Old Testament. They believed in God. Leading women were usually women of influence and affluence. They had money. 
they had power, they had position, or they were married to somebody in power and position, they were above the food chain. And they sustained the church ministry so that the church wouldn't go under. When Paul writes to the Thessalonians in the book of First, of Thess- uh, First and Second Thessalonians, he's writing to the church in Thessalonica, which is what we just read. Guess who would have been part of that core group? Jews, God-fearing Greeks, leading women. These women invested their time, their talent, their treasure, all of their assets. They said, Lord, what can I do to help this church grow? And as a result of that, Paul was able to write them decades afterward and encourage them. And if you read First and Second Thessalonians, you read that they are givers above and beyond anything. They love people, and they're sharing the message of Jesus. And it all started with Acts 17, verses 1 through 9. This is all part of this. They were persuaded, which means they were convinced. They examined it, and they found it to be valid. They're just like, yeah, I mean, I can't argue with this. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe I've been following my dad's view of Christianity or my pastor's view of Christianity or however it is. But they were, when they searched the Bible, they began to examine what they were raised in, and they were convinced, they were persuaded that, hey, this Jesus is who he says he is. In the words of C.S. Lewis, he's either a liar, lunatic, or Lord. He's one of the three. But don't say that he's just a good teacher. That's pretty pathetic. He was more than a teacher. He is either nuts, he claimed to be something that he wasn't, a liar, and he's a lunatic, he lost his mind, or if you come to the uh, deduction of it, or Jesus is who he says he was. Well, that means he's Lord. And if that means he's Lord, that means I got to do something with that. Accept it, reject it. The message of forgiveness extends to all people regardless of their social standing. The message of the gospel is for the person that's homeless on the street. The message of the gospel is for the person that's a multi-billionaire. And the message for the gospel is for the people practicing a gay lifestyle, a transgender lifestyle. The message of the gospel is for the people that are shacking up. They're not even married. The message of the gospel is for every ethnicity. It's for every addiction. It's for every struggle. It's for every brokenness. The message of the gospel is for the Christian himself and herself because the message of the gospel is what saves you and it's what sustains you. And if you and I lose sight of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and we think it's only for lost and broken people, you've missed the whole point. Because you will have to preach to yourself the gospel Because there's a Pharisee inside all of us. Well, I'm not like that woman over there. I'm not like that guy over there. I'm not. And you become a comparison, a comparing Pharisee. Lord, I go to 17 Bible studies in one day. And I fast 25 hours a day. I create an extra hour because I'm super religious. (laughs) And we think all of our performance is what God will be like, oh, I'm really proud of you. And Jesus says, if you take a look at the sinner, the, uh, the tax collector, all he is, he's just beating his breast, his chest. Lord, forgive me, a sinner. He's not even willing to even look up to the heavens. He's in the temple. He's offering a sacrifice, and he's just like, forgive me. And Jesus says, who goes away justified? Sure wasn't the Pharisee. It was the person who knows that they're broken. And they know that. Man, forgiveness extends to everybody. But are you willing to step into people's brokenness and ask them questions? So, hey, do you, got a, do you guys have a spiritual background? Do you, have, do you have like religious beliefs? Do you believe in good vibes? Whatever it is. Hey, tell me your story. You seem pretty interesting. You got tattoos everywhere. You shaved your head. Uh, you're super tall. You look like an NFL player. You look like you're Leonidas, whatever it may be. But the gospel has to be for all people. Because if not, man, if we don't believe the gospel is for all people, we're the problem. And we better get out of the way. Because if we would just submit our lives, submit our time to Jesus, Lord, what do you want me to serve? Let me just get involved with the serving thing. I don't, I'm, just to exercise that, Lord, uh, I have a talent. 
I can play music, I can preach, I can teach, I can um, bilingual, uh, I, I love evangelism. Hey, I'm, I have all these gifts. Lord, where do you want me to plug this into your church to help it grow? Lord, I'm very rich. I've been smart with my money. I'm maybe not super rich. I'm, I'm very affluential. I have extra money. Where do you want me to invest this? Because I can invest it in all my toys, but if I die, I ain't taking any of these toys home with me. So where do you want me to invest where I can build something that lasts a legacy? It goes above and beyond. It, it just outlives me well after me. I want to invest my time. I want to invest my talent, and I want to invest my treasure. But Lord, where do you want me to plug in? Because I want people to come to know Jesus. I want people to come to have this life-changing experience because I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. And when I die, I don't want to be the fool that's been saving everything, hoarding my time, my talent, my treasure, only to come to stand before Jesus himself. And he says, what did you do with that? I entrusted you with that, and you just kept it. I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I laid it all on the line. Because I want to live this life with no regrets, no retreats, and no reservations. When I cross that finish line of life, I want to just say, well, I, I have nothing else to give. And by God's grace and what Scripture says, we'll hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Jesus says, be very careful of how you handle money, people, treasure, everything. Because humans are just selfish. But lastly here, do you believe Jesus is worth the rejection? Paul shares the message, calls them up. They're like, yeah, sign it. we're going to join you. And then we have the hecklers that come in. Oh, boy, they're irate. There's some of the Jews, no, they were jealous. They formed a mob, and the city stirred it as an uproar. They stirred up the crowd, got the politics involved, and they were saying this message turned the known world upside down, and they're saying that there's another king, his name is Jesus, but there's only one king, is he's Caesar, and that could be borderline sedition where the people could be executed. They dragged Jason out. Where does this Jason character come in? Because he opened up his home, and he received the apostles there. He received them, so he's responsible for their conduct. Where's Paul and Silas? They're not there. We're taking you. They drag him out until he pays a bond, financial aspect, to say, you better get these guys out of the city or we're not going to give you your money back. But notice, they, notice all the turmoil that's happening. Jealous is to have an intense negative feeling over another person's achievements or success. Why are they jealous? Because the message of the gospel rang true in the synagogue and people's lives were changed. They stepped out of religion into a relationship with Jesus. And they were mad. Because some very influential women left the synagogue. They were very upset. So what do they do? Do they reason with Paul? No, they didn't have a reason. They don't have a, a reason from Scripture. So they resort to emotive reactions. Does that sound familiar today? I don't want to have a conversation with you. I'm just going to stir the emotions of everybody and get everybody yelling. Get Because then you can't talk. The emotionally trigger everybody around to form a mob and a frenzy so that they can get these people out. Why? Because the gospel challenges your way of life and it challenges what you truly believe. And you know what? Get this message out of here because we want our religion. We want, we want church done our way. And the gospel doesn't bow down to any of our desires. We have to bow down to the gospel. But I want us to end think, remembering this. God loves you. If you're listening to this message, I don't care what you're struggling with. It could be everything that we mentioned, and maybe it's more than that. I don't know. But God loves you enough that he steps into your worldview, how you view evil, how you view the world, how do you view pain and suffering, how do you view that there is a good God. That's called your worldview. How you view and interpret the world around you. God steps into your worldview or your religious beliefs because he wants to share the message of Jesus. And guess who he uses to do that? Us, broken, shattered, pathetic vessels that are just struggling to keep it together day to day. He uses us. But now that you know that, how would you respond? 
That's information I gave you. There's facts that I gave you. Or hopefully I reasoned with you from the scriptures. None of that saves you. That's all head knowledge. But what will you do with the head knowledge? Will you choose to believe it and say, Lord, I've been, I've been not living the life that, Lord, you've called me to live. And you know what? I've got to make some decisions in my life. There's some things I'm struggling with that I've got to, oh, man, I hear you, Jesus. I hear you. I hear you. I see you. It's evident. I'm experiencing you. Will you take that step and submit your life to him? Because if not, you're going to go away with a lot of head knowledge. Congratulations. But will you go home with a transformed experience? Because we're all about stepping into the brokenness and we're all about sharing Jesus. Point you directly to him. So as Pastor Felton comes up, we're going to sing a song. And during this time, if you will, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. Um, and if you're a born-again believer, you have a relationship with Jesus. And your walk with Jesus, again, it may be not be perfect, but you're like, yeah, I'm walking with Jesus. You know, please feel free to come on up. We're going to sing a song. But before you come on up, would you just take time to reflect upon your life? If you're struggling with something and it's just not shaking from your heart, don't just pass it by and come up and take a juice and a cracker. That's what these elements are. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians that a man must examine himself before you take communion, Lord's Supper. Examine your heart. Jesus, am I practicing sin willingly right now? And I'm aware of it. I just haven't done anything with it. If there's something in between your relationship with Jesus, don't come up and take the Lord's Supper. Instead, it'd be more honorable with integrity for you to stay where you're at, to be like, Lord, I'm that tax club. I'm just beating my chest right now. Lord, I need forgiveness. Forgive me. Help me to move forward in my relationship with you. If you have an issue with a brother or sister in Christ and you haven't resolved that, don't just pass by that. Be like, ah, oh, whatever. If there's something there that God has laid on your heart that you have not taken care of, during this last song, would you just go to the Lord in prayer? Say, Jesus, open up my heart. Forgive me. I want to get my relationship right with you. And if you would like somebody to pray with, I'm going to ask the deacons to come forward. They're going to be stationed on each side of the table right here. And if you need somebody to pray with you, we're down here just to lift you up in prayer. But if your relationship with God is, and you're walking with him, and you feel that, yeah, I want to take the Lord's Supper, you come as the Lord leads you. Come down into this bowl, take the elements and go back, and then we'll take communion together. But let's have a couple of minutes of just reflection before we take that move. Lord, I come. I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. For the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. If you're ready to come down and receive the elements, please feel free to come forward.
take the elements, take them back with you, sit down, and we'll take them together as a church family. Well, we have a good problem. We ran out of communion cups. Thanks, Caleb. Uh, no, that's those are it. Those are all that we had. So I apologize for those that did not have one, but if you wouldn't mind, um, we'll go ahead and uh, for the cups that we did have. In 1 Corinthians, Paul reminds us that if you eat the bread and you drink the cup, again, this is a wafer, this is grape juice. They don't save you. These are elements that we do in order to remember Christ. Paul says, before you do that, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 28, you must examine yourself and in so doing you're to eat the bread and drink of the cup. The reason why we take time to reflect upon our heart is because, man, we can so easily just run past what God is just churning in our heart. Conviction, that's a beautiful word. It's not a bad word. But as we pause, we cause ourselves to reflect Paul says in verse 29, For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. So if you have never taken the Lord's Supper with us, it's a two-part. Would you go ahead and peel that clear part back first to expose the wafer? 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. it says, And when he had given thanks, that's Jesus, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So please partake. In verse 25, for the second part, peel that foil piece back. Be very careful with that because if you don't do it right, it'll jump out at you. In verse 25, Paul says, in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Please partake. And then Paul reminds, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This message that Jesus went to the cross for, we're broken. He saves us. And this message, this gift is free. But you have to humble yourself. Come to the foot of the cross and receive it free. And let Jesus radically change your life. That's all free. This is the message we carry to your families, to your struggles, to your job, to the new adventure Jesus has for you on the horizon. Take this message. Share this hope. And this week, before I close us in prayer, let's be the hands, let's be the feet, let's be the mouthpiece of Jesus everywhere he sends you because somebody needs to hear this message. Please bow your heads with me. Father God, we just come before you and are just, um, I pray that we're encouraged. I pray that we're encouraged to just get to know people and their story. That if they look weird, dress weird, they smell weird, we don't care. They're created in your image and that's somebody's daughter. That's somebody's son. That's somebody's father, somebody's mother. Lord, would you create divine appointments where we will step in the brokenness with people? Ask them what their story is and that we would share our story and that, Holy Spirit, you will do what you do best. Bring conviction, win souls into your kingdom and that people will experience you genuinely. 
Lord, we love you. Just ask for blessing upon our week. Help us to be safe during this Labor Day weekend. And help us, Lord, to love on people as you would love them. In Jesus' mighty name that we pray, amen.